What I want to talk about is something that I call the common core of distributivity aspect and measurement. And so let me start by explaining what I mean by these three terms. And the way that I want to do this is by way of example, I will introduce three puzzles, one from each of these domains. And then I will suggest that there is a common solution to all these puzzles. And this common solution can be given in terms of a higher order property that I will call stratified reference. So the first puzzle I want to talk about concerns measurement. And it has to do with a construction that's called pseudoparatives or measure constructions of which you can see some examples on the handout in one. A pseudoparative is something like five pounds of rice. It's a construction that can be used to talk about a certain amount of substance or a certain event or, and it is used to characterize this amount in terms of one of its dimensions. For example, the dimension in five pounds of rice is of course weight. The dimension of five liters of water is volume and so on and so forth. And so what people have noticed, people like Krivka, like Schwarzschild, for example, have noticed is that not every measure function is admissible in pseudoparative constructions so that if you want to talk about the water in this water bottle, for example, then you could say there is half a liter of water in this bottle. What you're doing there is you're using a pseudoparative in order to talk about the water in this bottle in terms of its volume. You say its volume is half a liter. Now, you could also say there is half a kilo of water in this bottle. So you can use a pseudoparative to talk about the weight of the water in the bottle. But now suppose that I want to talk about the temperature of this bottle, the temperature of the water. It might be uh, something like 10 degrees Celsius. Now if I try to use a pseudoparative to talk about the water in this bottle in terms of temperature, as in there's a 10 degrees Celsius of water in this bottle, then something goes wrong. And the question here is first of all, what goes wrong? So why should it be that not every kind of measure function is admissible in a pseudoparative construction. And second, how can we characterize the class of measure functions that's admissible as opposed to those that aren't? So among the measure functions that are admissible, we find things like weight and volume, as I've already mentioned. We find duration, as in five hours of talks. We find spatial extent, as in five miles of railroad tracks. Among the, among the um, measure functions that are not admissible, we find temperature, as I've already mentioned. We also find speed. So if I try to talk about um, a driving event, I cannot characterize its, it in terms of its speed using a pseudoparative. If I could, I could say these are five miles per hour of my driving or of driving. Now, although I'll focus on pseudoparatives in this talk, I want to mention that this is a more general constraint that also occurs in other constructions like comparative determinants, for example. So if you use something like more rope in order to um, refer to or to describe a certain amount of rope, then this could in principle describe that amount of rope by length. So in a given context, you might, uh, you might say this to mean a longer amount of rope than some other amount of rope or Perhaps it might refer to the weight as in more rope by weight. So you can manipulate the context and you can come up with ways to make different measure functions admissible in this construction. But what you cannot do is to make temperature admissible. You cannot say more rope to mean an amount of rope whose temperature is higher than another amount of rope. And similarly, if you try to uh, characterize um, true partitives, if you, if you try to use true partitives, which are just like pseudo-partitives, except that there is a full noun phrase on the right and not just a substance noun, as in, for example, five hours of my driving or three liters of uh, the water in this bottle, those are true partitives, then just like in pseudo-partitives, you cannot use certain measure functions. You cannot say five miles per hour of my driving to refer to a driving event whose speed is five miles per hour.
Now, this has been known for a while, and one of the previous proposals, which is due to Schwarzschild, is that the difference between measure functions that are admissible and measure functions that aren't admissible in these constructions has to do with monotonicity. So if you imagine a measure function like volume, when I apply it to the water in this bottle, it gives us a certain value like 0.5 liters. When I apply it to one of the proper parts of the water in this bottle, like the water in the bottom half of this bottle, it will give us a smaller value than before. It will give us something like 0.25 liters. Now, in general, a measure function is monotonic if for parts of a given entity, it returns a smaller value than it returns when we apply it to the entire entity. So in that sense, volume is monotonic and weight is monotonic and spatial extent is monotonic, but speed is not monotonic. If I have a driving event that takes an hour and if I consider the first half of that driving event, then in general that first half will not have a smaller speed. It will not be slower than the entire driving event. It might have the same speed and it will typically have the same speed as the entire event. So speed is not monotonic and temperature is likewise not monotonic either because if the water in this bottle has a constant temperature throughout, then any of its parts has the same temperature as a whole. So then Schwarzschild says that the difference between measure functions that are admissible and those that aren't is exactly the difference between monotonic and non-monotonic measure functions. Now in general this is I think correct and this is a nice insight but if we look at certain cases that in fact Schwarzschild is already aware of, namely cases that involve more than one relevant dimension, and it turns out that there are certain measure functions that fall through the cracks in the sense that they are not monotonic but still they can be used in pseudoparticle constructions. And one example is height. So height is not a monotonic measure function. For example, if you imagine a city like Berlin and a certain amount of snow that fell on Berlin last night, then the snow that fell on Berlin consists of, um, for example, two parts. There's one way of thinking about it. It consists of the snow that fell on West Berlin and the snow that fell on East Berlin. And each of these is a part of the snow that fell on Berlin as a whole. Now, if we say that five inches of snow fell on Berlin, then we are not licensed to conclude that less than five inches of snow fell on West Berlin, even though the snow that fell on West Berlin is a proper part of the snow that fell on Berlin as a whole. So that means height is not monotonic, but I've just used a pseudoparticle construction in order to talk about the snow that fell on Berlin. So, in order to avoid this kind of problem, Schwarzschild has to say that the snow that fell on West Berlin is not a part of the snow that fell on Berlin as a whole. Not a part in the relevant sense. Now why should that be? Well, he says in any context where we use a pseudopartitive, that pseudopartitive makes a certain dimension salient. In this case, the dimension that's salient is height. And then when we consider the part for the relation um, that's relevant for pseudopartitives, we only pay, atten to pay attention to parts that differ in height, to roughly different horizontal layers. Now, this is an appeal to pragmatics which I see as problematic because Schwarzschild doesn't give us a theory that tells us on independent grounds under which circumstances a given entity is to count as a pragmatic part of a given other entity and under which circumstances it's not. So what I'll try to do is motivate a change to the definition of monotonicity that is going to take care of this problem and that's going to capture and subsume Schwarzschild's original insight but still allow us to get around the snow example. And in order to do that, rather than simply taking monotonicity and fiddling around with it a little bit, I first want to turn to another domain, another puzzle, and I want to use that other domain to develop a general notion that then I will use, uh, I will carry over back to pseudoparticles and thereby solve both puzzles at once. And that other domain is aspect. So 
What I mean by aspect for the purpose of this talk has to do with the difference between telic, between telic and atelic predicates. So just in order to make sure we're all on the same page, informally an atelic predicate is one which as soon as you engage in it, you've already engaged in it. So for example, run is atelic because as soon as you start running, you've already run. If I consider a predicate like run a mile, by contrast, that's a telic predicate. That's not the case. It's not the case that as soon as I start running a mile, I've already run a mile. So in the case of telic predicates, we say that they need to have, they need to reach a set terminal point, like the end of the mile, before they can count as having been done. Now, telic and atelic predicates are famous for the fact that only atelic predicates are compatible with four adverbials, which are things like four or five hours. So you can say John ran for five hours, but not, not John ran a mile for five hours. You'd have to say John ran a mile in five hours. Now, if we look at four adverbials, we find that they are compatible with different kinds of measure functions, just like pseudopartitives, and we also find that they are compatible with the same class of measure functions than pseudopartitives are. So, for example, we find temporal forward verbals, just like we found temporal pseudopartitives. So we have three hours of running, we have run for three hours. We also find spatial forward verbals, as in the crack widened for five meters, in example four. We have, but we don't have speed-related or temperature-related forward verbals. So we cannot say John drove for 30 miles an hour to mean John drove 30 miles an hour. We cannot say the soup boiled for, th for 100 degrees Celsius to mean the soup boiled at 100 degrees Celsius. So speed is out, temperature is out. So it seems like whatever we say about forward verbals might perhaps stand a chance to explain why only certain measure functions are compatible with forward verbals. And then once we have that, we can carry it over back to pseudopartitives. So that's the plan. So what I want to do now is build on a very old idea, which is due to uh, people like Doughty, and which tries to capture the nature of atelicity. So according to Doughty, a forward verbal is not simply stating that such and such an event took place and that it took a certain time. It also says that at every subinterval of the interval at which the event took, took place, there is also an event of the required kind. So roughly what this means is if I say for an hour, then according to Doughty, it means at each moment within this hour, or at each subinterval within this hour. This is formally captured in something called the subinterval property, which you find in seven. So this is an event-based reformulation of the subinterval property. It captures what Doughty originally did without events. And I'm adding events because by using events, I'm then going to be able to tell the same story for event-related pseudopartitives and for substance-related pseudopartitives later on. So this is why I'm using events here. So what I'm going to do now is talk about the subinterval property, show how it works, and show that it fails to capture atelicity. It doesn't accurately model it. It only models it as an idealization. But it can be modified in order to uh, avoid these problems. And once we've modified it, we, once we've generalized it, we're going to have a slightly more complicated property, which I'm going to call stratified reference, which is going to be a generalization of the telic atelic contrast. And then we're going to take that and derive the restriction on measure functions from this concept. And then I'll end the talk by talking about yet another domain, namely distributivity. The idea will be, in a nutshell, that stratified reference is distributivity. Stratified reference is atelicity, and stratified reference is monotonicity. So let's start with aspect. What you see in seven 
says that a certain predicate has the subinterval property. If whenever it holds of an event E, then at every subinterval of the time at which E takes place, there is a subevent of which that same predicate also holds. So for example, run has a subinterval property because whenever it applies to a running event that takes place at a certain time, then at every subinterval of that time, there is a part of that uh, of that event which is itself a running event. But that is not the case for run a mile. So this is an idealization because there are certain predicates which are compatible with forward verbials but which don't have the subinterval property when we look at very, very short temporal intervals. This is something that already Doughty was aware of and there are many ways to, um, to avoid this problem and I'll present one of them. So the problem is called the minimal parts problem and one way to illustrate it, um, the way that it is typically illustrated has to do with waltzing. So when you say something like John and Mary waltzed for an hour, this is acceptable. So this tells you that waltz is atelic. But the problem is that if you look at a snapshot of John and Mary, you can't tell just by looking at that snapshot whether they're waltzing or whether they're doing some other kind of dance. Right? They might be doing a foxtrot, for example. So in order to formulate the truth conditions of walls at very short intervals, you need to know what's going on at least for a few segments. Now what this means is if we require the subinterval property to hold of every predicate that's compatible with a forward verbal, then at least in the case of walls, it will be perhaps unknowable whether walls in fact has a subinterval property or not. Now in the case of walls, you might argue, well, maybe this is a case where um, the theory is underdetermined by the data. But if you look at other things like, for example, um, what you see in 9, then you see that really you need to take this, um, this problem uh, very seriously. So example 9 says, the Chinese people have created abundant folk arts passed on from generation to generation, 4,000 of years. So here, the shortest time at which a passing on event from generation to generation can take place is rather long, it's one generation. So that tells us that forward verbials cannot impose a subnormal property. They might impose something along the lines of the subnormal property, but not all the way down. There needs to be an end to it. To, um, there needs to be an end to how small the subintervals can get. Now, by the way, the subnormal property is hardwired for time. And since we want to talk about forward verbals not only in terms of um, the telic, a telic, opposition, but also in terms of which measure functions they are compatible with, we'll want to make sure that we generalize so that we not only talk about time, but also about space and about any measure function we want. So we'll want to generalize the subnormal property also in that respect so that we can deal with spatial forward verbals, which are known to give rise to something like the t lake a t lake opposition, but it's not quite the same thing as in the temporal domain. So you can say something like 10a, the crack widens for 5 meters, but you cannot say the crack widens 2 centimeters for 5 meters, not on the relevant reading. The relevant reading here would be the crack widens 2 centimeters from here to there, and again 2 centimeters from here to there, and again and again, and that goes on over a span of 5 meters. Now these examples have nothing to do with time, right? Both examples are examples of stative predicates. So <coughs> that shows that forward verbal, temporal forward verbals and spatial forward verbals don't have the same distributions. You could combine either one of these examples with a temporal forward verbal. What this means is we need to generalize, we need to parameterize the subnormal property so that temporal forward verbals check for something like it with respect to temporal subintervals and spatial forward verbals check for something like it with respect to spatial subintervals. So 
where are we now? We started with the summonable property, which goes down all the way and which is hardwired for time. We saw that we need to prevent it from going all the way down. And we saw that we need to make sure that sometimes it goes down to spatial subintervals, sometimes it goes down to temporal subintervals. This is what stratified reference will do for us. So let me, rather than giving you the definition of stratified reference directly, let me make a few changes to the subintervals property so that we eventually arrive at the definition of stratified reference. So let's start by applying the subintervals property to walls and let's see what it, it gives us. And you can see this in 12. So it tells us that whenever walls holds of an event E, then at every subinterval of the runtime of E, there is a subevent of which walls also holds. And we've seen that that's too strong because we want to avoid talking about infinitely small, infinitely short subintervals. So now we don't know where exactly the cutoff should be. I won't tell you. I'll just assume that there is a function, uh, there's a predicate epsilon that tells us where the cutoff is. And pretty much everybody who does similar things assumes something along these lines. So I'll assume that there is a predicate epsilon which takes a comparison class, like for example, the set of all one hour long intervals and which then takes a given interval and which, are, which returns true if that interval is very short as compared with the things in the comparison class. So if the comparison class is a set of all intervals that take one hour, then something like a three minute interval might qualify as very short. Now we want to be able to say about walls that whenever there's a waltzing event, and there's a way of dividing it into parts such that each of these parts is also a waltzing event and each of these parts has a runtime that counts as very short with respect to the, the runtime um, that's given to us by the forward verbal, like one hour for example. So to express this formally, I'll, I'll use uh, Godard Link's star operator, which essentially allows us to say about an entity or an event X that it consists of one or more parts such that a given predicate holds of each of these parts. What this means is we can formalize what I've just said as you see in 14. So 14 says just the same as what I've just given you in 13. And abstracting away from that example, I'll say that false has what I'll call stratified reference just in case 14 is true. Now I want to think of stratified reference as a higher order property, a property of predicates, just like the subintervals property, but I want to think of it in terms of, I want to think of it as a parameterized property. So these are my two parameters. One of them is epsilon, it's a granularity parameter. It tells us how, how much down we should look. And the other one is a dimension parameter. It tells us whether we should look at time or at space, for example. So let me say that, let me abbreviate 14 by what you see in 15. And we'll read this as follows. Walls has stratified reference with respect to the dimension runtime and the granularity epsilon of one hour. Now, we want a general definition, so we'll abstract from that example as you see on the next page. As you see in 16, we'll say that a given predicate P has stratified reference with respect to a measure function, with respect to a dimension F, that will be a measure function or a temporal trace function. And with respect to a given granularity parameter, epsilon comes with a comparison class K. If every entity or event X that is in P consists of one or more entities of events Y, entities or events Y such that P holds of each Y and each y is very short when we measure it along the dimension that's given to us by the relevant parameter. Now with this we can say what it means to be an atelic predicate. We can say being atelic means, doesn't mean having the subintervals property, but it means having stratified reference with respect to time and a suitably instantiated granularity parameter. So we can now say that 
four variables presuppose stratified reference as opposed to the subnormal property. We can say that walls for an hour is acceptable because even though walls doesn't have the subnormal property, it has stratified reference with respect to time and with respect to whatever counts as very short as compared to one hour. This is what you see in 17. Now if we have something like eat apples, just to give you another example, eat apples is also an atelic predicate because you can say eat apples for one hour. So here we say exactly the same as before and let me mention that I assume um, that apples literally means one or more apples, which might strike you as odd, but this is something that formal semanticists uh, believe in the majority. And it has good, there are good reasons for it having to do with downward entailing context. So eat apples literally means eat one or more apples. And what this means for us is eat apples for three hours presupposes that every event in which one or more apples are eaten consists of sub-events in which one or more apples are eaten and whose run times are very small compared with three hours. Now if I try to take a telic predicate like eat 10 apples, then that will fail to have stratified reference. So there will be a presupposition failure. The presupposition that fails here is that every event in which 10 apples are eaten consists of sub-events in each of which 10 apples are eaten um, in a very short time. So here I'm using uh, a notion of event that's closed under sum. So anytime you have an apple eating and another apple eating, you can put them together, you get another event, but it's not an eating of one apple anymore, it's an eating of two apples and so on. Okay, so now that we have a notion of atelicity that generalizes in the ways that we wanted to, let's go back to the measurement puzzle. Let's see what happens if we say nothing special about pseudoparticles except insofar as to say that three hours of running means the same exact thing as run for three hours. That is, a pseudoparticle has the same denotation and it imposes the same conditions, the same presuppositions as a corresponding four adverbial, if there is one. So we've seen that four adverbials reject the same kinds of measure functions as pseudoparticles do. So you cannot say John Joe 430 miles an hour or the soup boiled for 100 degrees Celsius. So let's assume that these four adverbials impose the same presuppositions as those that we've seen so far. So that, for example, drive 430 miles an hour presupposes stratified reference. But since now we have a speed forward verbal instead of a time forward verbal, I'll instantiate the dimension parameter accordingly so that drive 430 miles per hour has a presupposition that talks about the parts of any driving event in terms of them being very slow them having very small speed and not in terms of them having a very small runtime. What this means is that when we try to say drive 430 miles per hour, we presuppose something that makes no sense, namely that every driving, every driving event consists of one or more sub-events, each of which is a driving, whose speed is very small compared with 30 miles per hour. That is, it would have to be the case that if I take a a given driving event, a driving event from A to B, let's say, whose speed is 30 miles per hour, then there would have to be a way to divide it into one or more parts, let's say in three parts, such that each of these parts has a speed that's very small compared with 30 miles an hour. But if we start out with an event whose speed is constant, and there is no way that we can do this. Okay, so this is not yet about pseudoparticles, this is about forward verbals. So let's move over to pseudoparticles and let's just run the same principle again. So again, the idea is run for three hours and three hours of running impose the same constraint, they impose the same presupposition. In this case, the presupposition is satisfied as we've seen in the case of walls for three hours. It's the same basic idea. 
So now let's see what happens if we move from an event pseudopartitive to, pseudopartitive to a substance pseudopartitive, like 30 liters of water. So here, instead of talking about events, we talk about amounts of water. And instead of requiring something about the, um, the um, let's say, uh, the temporal extent of the parts of the entity in question, we require something about their volume. So what do we require exactly? We require that every water amount consists of parts such that each of these parts is itself water and each of these parts has a very small volume compared with 30 liters. And if you think about it, that's true, right? If we, you take a certain amount of water, let's pretend that there are 30 liters of water in this little bottle. If we, if we think about whether there is a way to divide it into parts such that each part is again water and each part has a very small volume, then certainly there won't be a problem doing that. There will never be a problem doing that. And so the presupposition is satisfied. So let's make sure that we still rule out the temperature example. Let's make sure that we still have an explanation of why we can't say 30 degrees Celsius of water to talk about an amount of water whose temperature is 30 degrees Celsius. Well, let's see what the presupposition would have to be. The presupposition would have to be that every water amount consists of water parts whose temperatures are very small compared with 30 degrees Celsius. So for every amount of water, there is a way to divide it into parts, one or more parts, such that each of these parts is very cold. Now, there will be some amounts of water for which that's the case, namely those that are themselves very cold, but those ones we can't refer to using something like um, 30 degrees Celsius. There will also be water amounts whose temperature as a whole is 30 degrees Celsius, but then there's no way to divide them into parts such that those parts are very cold compared with 30 degrees Celsius. And so the presupposition fails. So, so far we've retraced the steps of the previous account. So let's make sure that we also succeed in that case that I mentioned as a problem for the previous account, namely five feet of snow. So remember the problem was we can say five feet of snow to talk about the snow that fell on the city of Berlin, even though it's not the case that every part of the snow that fell on Berlin as a whole has a smaller height than the snow that fell on Berlin as a whole. So let's make sure that the measure function height is compatible with pseudopartitives even though it's not an, a monotonic measure function. Well, as it turns out, we don't require monotonicity. Everything we require is that every amount of snow consists of snow parts whose heights are very small compared to five feet. That is, every time I have an amount of snow, then there is a way to divide it into parts such that each part is itself snow and each part um, has a very small height compared with five feet. So if you think about how the snow that fell on Berlin consists of several horizontal layers, then this will not be a problem. We, we take the snow as a whole and then we divide it horizontally and then each layer is snow and each layer has a very small height compared with the height of the snow as a whole. So we no longer require that every part of the snow has a smaller height than the entire snow. We don't require, for example, that the snow that fell on West Berlin has a smaller height than the snow that fell on Berlin as a whole. All that has to be the case is that there is a way to divide any amount of snow into parts such that each part has a very small height. And so that's what I want to suggest as an answer to the measurement puzzle, that namely the class of measure functions that we can use in these constructions is exactly those that cause the pseudopartitive as a whole to satisfy stratified reference, where the dimension parameter is specified by the measure function in question. So if you start with a measure function that's monotonic, 
then it will always satisfy this constraint. But even if you start with certain measure functions that are not monotonic, like height, then there is a chance that they may still satisfy this constraint as we've just seen. And as for the question, why should there be constructions in the first place that impose this restriction? Well, all I can say is that it's not something special about measurement or it's not something special about aspect, but there is this general constraint that spans both domains, aspect and measurement, and therefore we can we can hypothesize that it is maybe something fundamental to language, something that might occur even in other domains. And so I want to turn to the third domain, namely distributivity. So <coughs> what I want to suggest is that stratified reference is distributivity. More specifically, the difference between distributive predicates and collective predicates can be captured by saying that distributive predicates have stratified reference, except that now we'll have to think again about how we instantiate the relevant parameters. So, just to make sure we're on the same page, distributive predicates are predicates which when you apply them to an entire, when, when you apply them to an entire group, then they are also applied to every member of that group. So, smile is distributive because if the, the group of boys smiles, if the boys smile, then each of the boys smiles. Collective predicates don't have that property. So if the boys met, it's not the case that each of the boys met. If the boys are numerous, it's not the case that each of the boys is numerous and so on. So what we want to do in order to capture that is to say that a distributive predicate is one that has stratified reference along the dimensions that, the dimension that is specified by the relevant thematic role. And I'll explain what that means when we get to it. But first, I want to introduce one more puzzle. And the puzzle has to do with something that's called cumulative readings. So let me explain what cumulative readings are. Cumulative readings are a kind of reading that's also called scopeless. A cumulative reading involves two quantifiers, typically two indefinite numerals or two definite numerals, um, that uh, where none of the two quantifiers take scope over the other one. None of them distributes over the other one. And there's also no collectivity involved. So one example is what you see in 26. Three safari participants saw 30 zebras. Now this sentence has different readings, but the one I want to focus on is the one where there's a total of three safari participants and there's a total of 30 zebras. And each of the safari participants saw some of the zebras and between them, they saw a total of 30 zebras. So, this is a cumulative reading. There is another kind of construction that looks very similar to this one and which Eitan Zweig in his dissertation has argued um, is also scopeless and which we can, if we squint a little bit, we can also see it as a, an instance of a cumulative reading and that construction has to do with dependent plurals. So the de dependent plurals are plurals which are um, C commanded by another plural co-argument and which have certain odd semantic properties having to do with whether they are interpreted as one or more or more than one. And I'll give you an example which you see in 27a. So the example is three safari participants saw zebras. And what this means is that each of the three saw one or more zebras and overall they saw two or more zebras. So here there isn't a need to postulate any scopal dependency between the two, uh, the two noun phrases and that's why we can see this as a scopeless reading, as a, a kind of cumulative reading. Okay, so let me explain what the puzzle is. The puzzle is that, the puzzle has to do with the word all. When we take the sentences that I've just described to you, when we add the word all to them, then the cumulative reading disappears in the first case, but not in the second case. For example, if we go back to three safari participants saw 30 zebras, and if we assume that there is a total of three safari participants, so they are all the safari participants, 
Now, if we try to say in the same scenario that makes the first sentence true, if we try to say all the safari participants saw 30 zebras, then suddenly the sentence is no longer true. The sentence requires that each of the safari participants by himself or herself sees 30 zebras. They might all see the same set or they might see different sets, but each of them has to see a total of 30 zebras, so the cumulative reading has disappeared. Now let's move back to the other sentence that I mentioned, the one with the dependent plural. If we do the same here, we might expect that the cumulative reading also disappears, but oddly enough it doesn't. That is, if we say all the safari participants saw zebras, then this can, this just as the previous sentence can involve a dependent plural. That is, it can mean that each of the safari participants saw at least one zebra and overall at least two zebras were seen. So what is it about all that makes it sensitive to the verb phrase? And what is it about all that causes cumulative readings to disappear in some cases but not in others? Or to put it in a different way, what is the difference between C zebras and C30 zebras? And for whatever reason, all is sensitive to that difference. Now, what I want to suggest is that the difference between C zebras and C30 zebras in the domain of distributivity is analogous to the difference between eat apples and eat three apples that we've seen in the domain of aspect. That is, there is a certain sense in which C zebras is what we might call atelic, only that this time it's not about distributing down to temporal intervals or even spatial intervals. This time it's about distributing down to agents. So let me explain what I mean by that. So the word all is known for being compatible with all distributive predicates and with certain collective predicates but not others. So you can put it together with a distributive predicate like smiled as you see in 28a you can say all the children smiled and then it will entail that each child smiled. Okay, so this makes it look like it's a distributive determiner. And also you can say all the children are numerous. Uh, you cannot say all the children are numerous. Okay, so that again makes all look like it's a distributive determiner. But on the other hand, it's... Um, uh, okay, I'll... I'll what I'm not focusing on here, I've left that out, is that there are certain other collective predicates like met and gathered um, which are actually compatible with all. I've left them aside for this talk or you can ask me about them later on. Here all I want to focus on is that the word all is, similarly, is similar to the word each and the word every in that it seems to require distributivity, at least in some of the cases. So what I want to suggest is that the word all presupposes that the predicate that it combines with has distributivity. Just like four verbials presuppose that the predicate that they combine with has stratified reference down to very small amounts of time or space. So let's see if we can tell the same story for all as we did for four verbials. Let's see if we can say that all presupposes stratified reference. What could that mean? Well, when we think about what all does, when we say all the children smiled, it says that each atom in the group of children that we're talking about smiled. When we try to say all the children are numerous, it's odd because it suggests that each of the children in question is by itself numerous. And when we say all the committees are numerous, and this is fine again because we talk about each of the committees in question and we say that it is numerous. So let me suggest that what all does is it presupposes that the verb phrase has stratified reference only that this time we don't distribute down to very small things, we distribute down all the way to atoms so the granularity parameter this time is instantiated with the predicate atom and no longer with the predicate epsilon and as for the dimension parameter, 
it's no longer time or space, but it's the thematic role in question. So when we have a predicate like smile, then what this will mean, as you see in 31, is that we presuppose that whenever there's a smiling event, and keep in mind that this might be a sum of several other events, whenever we have a smiling event, then there is a way to, there is a way to divide it into parts such that each of these parts is a smiling event whose agent is an atom. So if you take an event that involves three boys, for example, it has to be the case that it consists of one or more, in this case of three sub-events, such that each of them is a smiling event itself, whose agent is an atom. This is where distributivity is captured via stratified reference. Now, suppose that that's the case. Suppose that all requires that the predicate that it combines with has stratified reference in the relevant sense, then I suggest we have an explanation for why there is a difference between C zebras and C30 zebras, and why that difference is analogous to the difference between eat apples and eat 30 apples. The difference is that C zebras has stratified reference with the relevant parameters, whereas C30 zebras does not. So let me explain that. So remember that I assume that Zebras means one or more zebras, literally. So when we say C zebras, then we are talking about any event which is a seeing event and whose theme is one or more zebras. And now keep in mind that I assume that predicates are closed under some. So whenever we have two events, then there is an event that forms their sum. And in fact, whenever we have two seeing events, then the sum of these two seeing events will itself be a seeing event. I make that assumption following uh, Krivka, following Katza, and I make that assumption crucially only for verbs, not for entire verb phrases. What that means is when we have a predicate like C zebras, it will be true, among other things, of events like the following. Suppose that all of the people in this room go on a safari. We all go on a safari and each of us sees one or maybe two zebras. Then for each of us there will be a seeing zebras event and the sum of all these events will itself be a seeing event. And since in each of these events one or more zebras are seen, it will also be the case that in the sum of all of these events a total of one or more, most likely more than one, zebra will be seen. That means when we have when we consider the kinds of events that are in the denotation of C zebras, among them there will be large events. Now, what does it mean for C zebras to have stratified reference? This is what you see in 34. It means every such event can, can be divided into parts again, such that each of these parts is a seeing event in which one or more zebras is seen. So if we start with the event that I've just described, then that will be the case. Now we want to make sure that there is a difference between C zebras and C30 zebras. We want to make sure that C30 zebras fails to have stratified reference. So let me explain why it fails. Suppose that each of us sees a couple zebras and between us we happen to see 30 of them. Now that means that there is a there is an event which counts as a seeing event and whose theme counts as 30 zebras. But now, if I ask you to take this event and divide it into parts in the following way, then you will fail. If I ask you to divide this event into parts such that each of the parts is a seeing event in which 30 zebras are seen and whose agent is an atom, then you won't manage to do that. That's because you would need to divide it so that for each of us there is a part in which we see 30 zebras. There is a part in which I see 30 zebras, there is a part in which you see 30 zebras and so on. And assuming that we are in a scenario where each of us saw only some of the 30 zebras in question, that will not work. So what we're doing here is kind of like a spectral composition but in the domain of distributivity. We're explaining why certain predicates have or don't have stratified reference with respect to agents and atoms rather than with respect to time and 
a certain epsilon. So this is what I want to suggest in a nutshell. The difference between eat apples and eat 30 apples and the difference between seed zebras and seed 30 zebras is parallel. It doesn't mean that it's the same, right? So it doesn't mean that C30 zebras is telic. It isn't. C30 zebras is atelic. You can say, I saw 30 zebras for an hour, no problem. But once we keep the difference between time and agents, uh, in, once, we, once we take that difference into account, then it's possible to say that um, the two oppositions are analogous, even though they're not the same. Now, for reasons of time, I don't want to go through the rest of the talk in as much detail as, as I've done so far. Let me just say that what I've said about distributivity in the case of all can also be said about distributivity in the cases of the word each and its counterparts across languages like the, the German word jeweils. And it can also be said about distributivity operator like the one suggested by Link the one suggested by Schwarzschild. The basic idea is that we can capture the similarities and the differences of these various items, whether they are overt or covert, by varying the parameters of stratified reference. So that, for example, the word each will distribute down to atoms. Link's D operator will also distribute down to atoms. Schwarzschild's D operator will distribute down to non-atomic parts of a salient cover. So we capture that we can capture that by varying the granularity parameter. And one of the things that have be, has been observed about the word jeweils is that sometimes it cannot be translated as each, but sometimes it can only be translated as each time or on each occasion. So when you say Hans hat jeweils zwei Affen gesehen, as in 37, um, this literally means uh, this literally translates to Hans has jeweils two monkeys seen, has Hans has seen, has seen two monkeys jeweils. And what it actually means is he has seen two monkeys on each occasion. So there needs to be a salient set of occasions like visits to the zoo, for example. So we cannot use each here. But in other cases, jeweils does translate as each. So if we say, die Kinder haben jeweils zwei Affen gesehen, as in 36, this translates as the children have seen two monkeys each. And this might involve distributing the property of seeing two monkeys over salient, um, over salient amounts of time, as in the previous example, but more likely it will involve distributing the property over each of the children in question. So we can capture that by saying that the, the word jeweils is underspecified for its dimension parameter. It can, uh, the parameter can be instantiated either by time or by a thematic role, like the thematic role carried by the boys. And it's also underspecified with respect to the granularity parameter. It can distribute down to atoms or it can distribute down to salient non-atomic parts. As for the word each, however, that one is hardwired. That one, that one can only distribute down to atoms and it can only distribute over a dimension that's specified by a thematic role. It cannot be um, instantiated by time. So what this means is that we have this notion that captures what it means to be a distributive predicate. It captures what it means to be an atelic predicate. And it captures what it means to be a monotonic measure function. So. If this is on the right track, then we can do the following. This is where I want to wrap up the talk as in page 11. First of all, we can build on Link's generalization between the um, count versus the singular versus plural opposition and the count versus mass opposition. We can also build on uh, Bach's generalization and Klifka's generalization that says that the count mass and singular plural oppositions are intimately related to the 
telic, atelic opposition. I've done that when I, I use the same setup for event-related and substance-related pseudopartitives. And we can add to these oppositions the distributive collective opposition so that being distributive is in a certain sense analogous to being atelic or being mass or being plural. Being collective is analogous to the uh, being telic or being singular. And moreover, we can do this not only as a theoretical exercise, but also we can see that certain constructions give linguistic bite to these generalizations and to these um, to, to the bridge that, uh, that crosses these oppositions in the sense that we've seen that uh, the constraints that these constructions impose can be described by a very specific property that instantiates uh, these oppositions and the, the relevant ways. Thank you.